What's a hero or heroine? A person who is admired for courage, outstanding achievements, and or noble qualities. Who are the heroes or heroines in your life? What do they look like? Do they look like you? Can you look in the mirror and see the hero or heroine that may be inside of you? Although we can define the terms hero and heroine, they are often identified based on our own values. But what isn't necessarily arguable is that if I can see a hero or heroine who looks like me, then I will be more likely to believe that I too have some of those qualities inside of myself. What if I don't see any or can't visualize any heroes or heroines who look like me? Am I less likely to see myself with the noble qualities I admire in others? Would others perceive me with fewer heroic qualities if they can't see heroes or heroines who look like me? Welcome to Small and Gutsy, a podcast featuring interviews with nonprofit and social impact organizations under $10 million. My name is Laura Whitkoff, and I'm excited and proud to be your host. My hope is that you love the stories as much as we do, and perhaps you will find needed services, a job, volunteer, or donate. Feel free to pass along any valuable information you hear today to others, and remember to send me the name of any organization you'd like featured at reachus at theintrinsicgroup.com. I remember learning that Emma Lazarus had written the famous sonnet cast into the bronze plaque at the base of the Statue of Liberty, the new Colossus, very familiar to many of us. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Realizing that she was not only Jewish, but actually a relative of mine, deeply spoke to me as my mother fled to this country from Austria during World War II. That genuine pride of being connected to a fundamental part of history that gives any marginalized individual not just a sense of pride, but a sense of belonging in a world where being marginalized feels literally and figuratively like a second skin. David Heredia, the founder, creator, and genius behind the organization Heroes of Color and his book Little Heroes of Color, was possibly thinking the same thing as he observed his own children competing in a mostly white environment. Why shouldn't all children be exposed to heroic figures from history who look like them? How can they feel not just a sense of pride, but a sense of true belonging as folks who look like them have contributed and continue to contribute to our world in significant ways? Heroes of Color is an art organization that promotes inclusion and diversity through art and education. David achieves this through professional and creative arts workshops that are designed to help turn young artists into entrepreneurs, or as David calls them, entrepreneurs, which I absolutely love. David also captures issues related to diversity, equity, and inclusion through animation storytelling. I am so very excited to introduce CEO and founder David Heredia. Welcome, David. Please share with me your passion about Heroes of Color, how this all got started, where you want to take it. It's an incredible concept. Thank you so much, Laura, for that incredible introduction. You know, like many things that I do, I think Heroes of Color was something that was born more out of frustration than anything else. Just to take it back a little bit, I've always worked with, you know, multiculturalism and making sure that the work that I create reflects the society that I live in. But I didn't really, really take it seriously up until 1996 when I applied for a job at the Harlem YMCA. It was for an art coordinator position. Mm -hmm. And I remember it like it happened yesterday. I was sharing my portfolio with the director and he's looking through and in my mind, I'm thinking, I know I got this job. I know I nailed Mm -hmm. it because my portfolio is super tight. And his face was just straight, like didn't even smile. So I'm starting to get nervous. And then after he closes the book, he says, "Uh, this is great work. This is really good work. He says, but I have one question for you. Why are every single one of your characters white? Mm. And I couldn't answer it. I could not answer it. And he mentioned to me, you know, you have to understand the power that you have as a creator, as a content Mm -hmm. creator. Mm -hmm. And there are so many messages. There are so many stories that you can tell, but you can't tell them until you start to represent yourself like you're not even represented in your own work so I was like oh my god I felt embarrassed Mm -hmm. I felt like I just Mm -hmm. felt all kinds of different ways Mm -hmm. and from that moment on was when I decided that everything I draw 
has to be inclusive. Like it has to include multiple, Mm -hmm. you know, and more, more importantly, I need to see myself in my own work. What a moment of awakening. Incredible. It's funny because my four older brothers never mentioned it to me. You know, my mother never mentioned it to me. And it just, it just becomes part of your reality, which is sad. You know, it's part of the brainwashing that happens in schools when Mm -hmm. you don't see yourself or people of your culture represented in a positive way. I'm going to be honest with you. I felt like if my portfolio had nothing but dark skinned characters, it might not be well received. Mm-hmm. As if it were yeah. light skin yeah. characters. Mm-hmm. It, it was a lot of unlearning that I had to do. Mm-hmm. And I'm so grateful to him for doing that because I ended up getting the job, by the way. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but for him to have shared that with you. Oh, was, that was powerful. That's the perfect word for it. It was powerful because it was such an eye opening experience. And then the other thing that you said that I deeply feel is if you're in an environment where there is nothing that is reflected, it isn't your fault until you reach outside of that or something changes it because that's all that we're given. But what a moment for you. It was huge, you know, and then um, fast forward, I'm originally from New York and I moved to California in 2002 to work for the animation industry. Mm. I ended up at Walt Disney Feature Animation, which the first four years were fantastic, but something happened to me at Disney, not specifically with the people there. I mean, it was Mm -hmm. a great company, but it was something I was starting to change. You know, when we're watching these movies at Disney, why am I still just seeing black or Asian folks in the background? And I can probably count how many on one in one hand. I started doing my own stuff on the side. Mm -hmm. And I did this series called um, Colores de Nuestras Culturas, which is the colors of our culture. And these Mm -hmm. are just art prints representing different countries from around the world. I got an an exhibitor's table at San Diego Comic Convention, which is like huge. Mm -hmm. And it went so well, Laura. It went so incredibly well. And then when I got back to my office at Disney, I had a phone message from the attorney. And he said, "Um, we need to have a talk because Mm. you're not allowed to be doing or selling or creating anything outside of Disney. It's more a, um, an issue so that they can protect their mm-hmm. copyrights and their work. I mean, I get it, but they take it to the extreme that you literally cannot draw anything. So I said, well, I need to think about where I want to go. Mm-hmm. What is really important to me? Number one, as an individual, but number two, as an artist. Yeah, so I absolutely. went back to thinking about Charles, who was a director at the Harlem YMCA in 1996. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things he mentioned to me was there absolutely has to be something that you stand for, that Mm -hmm. no matter what, this is what's important to you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that taking that path might mean you're going to make less money, Mm -hmm. but this means you're going to be fulfilled. Right. Everybody needs to figure out what that thing is because it's different for everybody. At that moment, I felt like, well, what's important to me is representation. The plans that I have for myself are bigger than the plans Disney has for me. Exactly. So on a friendly, very professional level, I gave my two weeks notice and I left. My mother thought I was crazy. Everybody thought I was crazy, yeah. but I knew what I was doing. Mm-hmm. I was scared. Mm-hmm. Of course. <laughs> I, was, I was terrified, mm-hmm. but I knew that this was the right path that I should be on. Mm-hmm. And I stumbled and stumbled and things didn't go quite as planned. And then I got married and then I had my first child and everything, everything changed. Now I was looking for children's books with Spanish speaking characters, dark skin mm-hmm. characters, Asian characters, and I wasn't finding many. This is what gave birth to Heroes of Color. Wow. As I was saying, the frustration of not being able to find what I wanted for my children. And mm-hmm. I knew very well, once they started school, they were not going to get this type of cultural education. So, you know, as parents, that's that's our job. You know, we pass down mm-hmm. our culture to our children. One of the reasons why I love art is not only do you have the power to tell the stories that you want to tell, but you actually get into the process of preserving your culture. 
through art. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's Beautiful a great way said. to preserve it. Mm -hmm. So I'm from the Dominican Republic. My wife is from Mexico. So mm -hmm. the artwork that comes out of these countries are very different. The music, the food. So we're mm -hmm. able to share that with our kids, you know, and they get all of that and, and they love it and they learn to appreciate it. So mm -hmm. I had a hard time finding those types of books. So I started creating my own and mm -hmm. I just like, you know, little drawings and I'll staple them together and read them to my kids, like nothing big, but they loved it, you know? Yeah. And so that really was what got my wheels turning. Mm -hmm. In 2015, my oldest daughter was already six years old. Um, my son was, I believe, five mm -hmm. and he started getting into my comic book collection. So we would look at comic books together mm -hmm. And he's like, he's like, are there any, any like black superheroes that look like mm -hmm. us? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, pff, there's dozens of them, tons yeah. of them. This was before Black Panther came out. We mm -hmm. couldn't find one guy on the cover or girl on the cover that was of, of color. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh man. And so he's looking at me like, well, I don't see any. I'm like, you know what? Let's go home. I'm going to Google it. I'm pretty sure we'll come up with some stuff. I Googled superheroes of color. Mm -hmm. And this is where the name came from. So when I did Superheroes of Color, real people came back in the search, like real people in real life that had done these amazing things. And I was like, mm -hmm. whoa, I've never heard of this person. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I always told my mother that there were two things that I wanted to be in life, an architect or the other was a history teacher. Neither of the two happened, but I was able to include history in the work mm -hmm. that I do, mm -hmm. you know, so it worked out really well. So... All of those things really is what formed Heroes of Color. Mm -hmm. And in 2015 was when I did my first short video. And mm -hmm. it was well-received, but it was also not so well-received by others. And I'm okay with that. I understand that, you know, the type of work that I do is not for everybody. You know, mm -hmm. and the minute I try to please everybody, that's when I lose. You know, yeah, so I, I, mm -hmm. I sort of pick and choose my battles. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think it was Gaspar Yanga. That video ended up getting on the Spanish website called Remezcla, mm -hmm. which is pretty big. Um, but the reviews were very mixed, you know, and, mm -hmm. and I started actually getting like hate mail, which I'd uh. never received before. You know, my wife was like, do you really want to keep doing this type of stuff? I mean, you mm -hmm. know, maybe That's you can scary. just... Yeah, like just go get a job at a college and just be done with it. And I'm like, if I do that, I wouldn't be me. And what was the hate mail in reference to? Because it's like you're you're just celebrating a piece of history that exists. You're not making something up. I think what it is, Laura, is anytime somebody takes pride in their culture, yeah. other people feel insecure. Just by you taking pride in your culture doesn't mean that you don't like other cultures. Other cultures. That's such an important point. You know, if somebody tells me, hey, this is racist and this is horrible, why are you teaching hate? I welcome a conversation and I say, oh, you're entitled to that opinion, but mm -hmm. please enlighten me and let me know what about this work makes you feel that it's racist and hate hateful. Like, share that mm -hmm. with me so that I can have a, a better understanding about where this is coming from. Nine times out of ten, they're not able to really articulate where that is, like, what that is. I know that I am specifically making these videos to number one, inspire, to encourage, and to empower children to number one, tell the stories they want to hear. Mm -hmm. Number two, question th their teachers. If mm -hmm. there are some materials they're not learning, <laughs> why aren't we learning about such and such group? I'd love to learn more about them. You know, if it's not part of the curriculum, mm -hmm. recommend some books that I can pick up. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. really make an effort to include all of us in, in the lesson plans. Something happened not too long ago. I'm sort of jumping the gun, but I have to no, bring this okay. up. My youngest daughter, she's in the second grade. They were giving an assignment called Meet the Masters. And it was a series to sort of highlight the, the master painters from back in the day, Michelangelo, mm -hmm. Leonardo, all mm -hmm. those great guys, right? I'm helping my daughter through this, these assignments I'm thinking, geez, I haven't seen one person of color in this whole series. I raised the question to her teacher. I said, I'm just curious to know if you have outlined any painters of color in your series, because I don't see any. I can recommend mm -hmm. a few. And she's like, you know, well, this is what the district gives us. And so we have to follow what the district gives us. I said, well, 
you know, the district is giving you very specific information that will skew the perspective of what a master painter looks like. Absolutely. My daughter and my son are going to think that master painters are only European and that's it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and I said, I, as a parent, have a problem with that. And I'm sure there maybe are some others who do too. So I'm going to go ahead and recommend a list for you to look at and, you know, diversify your list a little bit. And I don't think she meant it this way to be like disrespectful, but she said, what makes you an expert in the field of, you know, like diverse painters? <laughs> wow. I say, oh, wow. you know, you're just trying to give her a resource to take a look and have exactly. her homework. Exactly. So uh -huh. I said, well, mm -hmm. you know, to answer your question, number one, I'm an artist. Mm -hmm. um, and number two, I'm dedicated entirely to ensuring that children are exposed to themselves. You know, mm -hmm. I'm 43 years old and I'm looking at what my children are learning. They're learning exactly what I learn. Exactly. And, and that's point. and that's a problem, you know. So I didn't think much of it. So the teacher went and on her own, she bought my book. She started watching my videos. She spent some time on my website. Mm -hmm. And I was completely thrown back when one day my daughter comes running to me. And she's like, Papi, come look, come look. And I look at her computer screen. The teacher has my book up and she's talking to the kids about some of the heroes in the book. And then she goes, now we're going to go to a short clip and learn more about these heroes. So there's, there's this little video series that I did, just one minute clips, highlighting mm -hmm. some of the characters in my book. And my oldest daughter narrates it. After she plays the video, she starts talking to them about it. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. Never again am I going to believe a teacher when she says, I can't change the curriculum. I can't right. do anything about it. This mm -hmm. is what we're given. Mm -hmm. She took it upon herself to take five minutes out of her day to mm -hmm. make sure this was included. Every month since, she's shown at least three videos and is mm -hmm. highlighting different characters in the book. I'm like, this is, this is amazing. You have really changed not only that one teacher's perspective, but all the kids in her class. You never know the impact that you're going to have when one person takes it upon themselves. But I have to go back to something you said before. I actually think you satisfied your dream of becoming an architect and a history teacher. <laughs> it really is a combination. It wasn't the first time that something like this had happened. You know, the first time this happened was with my oldest daughter um, when she was given an assignment to highlight an American hero. Mm. And very similar situation. They were all, you know, white, white people on the list. Mm -hmm. And she um, raised her hand and said that she wanted to do somebody of color because she didn't see one on the list. Now, mm -hmm. you have to understand where that came from. That comes from whenever I'm doing my work, my heroes of color work, the videos, my kids are always around me. Of course. So they're, they're watching mm -hmm. what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. and that in itself has shaped the work that I do because mm -hmm. I want to make sure that they can see it and learn from it. That wasn't the amazing part. The amazing part was that after she said that, half of the classroom said, well, hey, I, I want to do somebody from the Philippines. I'm from mm -hmm. the Philippines. Mm -hmm. So it just sparked off this thing where now, you know, the teacher was forced to allow students to Good. pick their own heroes. Good. You know, mm -hmm. so that's the type of impact that I know this work has in the classroom. You know, and then they take that conversation home. Absolutely. And now their parents have to talk about this. You know, mm -hmm. wow, that's great. Your teacher is allowing you to do a character from the Philippines, you know, mm -hmm. and they get all this sense of pride. So it's bigger than me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's not something that I anticipated. I started it solely for the purpose of making sure my kids grow up with a broader spectrum of who are heroes, mm -hmm. you know, and in doing so, I think other people have sort of, you know, I guess, woken up to mm -hmm. the reality that maybe our history was a one-sided story. And right. so we weren't right. really taught the full, you know, mm -hmm. both sides of the story. I have to be reminded every now and again that it's okay to put this type of work out there because there are so many people who want to highlight the negative and want mm -hmm. to you know, tear you down and, and just mm -hmm. make you feel like you're doing something wrong. And mm -hmm. I'm, I won't lie to you. I mean, there are moments where I feel like a little bit of doubt, 
you know, but then I'm reminded of stories of things that happened with my children, you mm -hmm. know, and how they mm -hmm. stood up for themselves or how they stood up for somebody else in a similar mm -hmm. situation. And that makes me feel like this is, no, this is the right path. This is mm -hmm. where I should be going. I often wondered about the school system and why it is that this is still such an ongoing battle. And mm -hmm. so this, the principal at the school where my kids go, I had offered them a workshop. I wanted to mm -hmm. do a workshop series. There's one that I do called Little Heroes of Color Workshop. Mm -hmm. And in it, we talk about, you know, the definition of discrimination. I mm -hmm. show it through examples. There's this little test that I do where I talk about, like, how do we mm -hmm. discriminate, right? The reason why we do it is because we're specifically focused on a certain group of people that we're mm -hmm. told are either good or bad. Right. But while we're doing that, we're missing out on everything else that's around us. Mm -hmm. And so the test that I do is I put up an image with a, a bunch of different colored dots. Mm -hmm. And I say, if anybody can guess, I'm going to put up on the screen for just two seconds. If you can guess how many blue dots are on the screen, you'll win a Little Heroes of Color book. How, I remember, originally I said, tell me how many blue dots are there. Mm -hmm. So then I say... Who can tell me how many orange dots were on the screen? Exactly. And they're like, nobody. <laughs> you didn't know. Right. Uh -huh. I don't know. I wasn't exactly. paying attention to that. I mm -hmm. said, so that's that's the problem with how discrimination works mm -hmm. is you're you're told not to pay attention to other things, just mm -hmm. focus on one. And that's why the history is so wrong. Mm -hmm. Because we're just focusing on one group. And when there's so many other beautiful colored dots around us but we're not accessing them. We're not even acknowledging them, mm -hmm. you know. It's a great example to show them in a really quick way what people are missing when you don't consider inclusion, when you don't really take it all in, and when you leave certain groups out. It's a really, really good example. That's a great exercise. It is amazing to see their responses and reactions yeah. to it. Yeah. And then, you know, whatever, I go on with more examples, and then we'll talk about some of the heroes, and then I'll show a quick video, um, and then I'll do a quiz. And so I was pitching this to the teacher, and she's like, oh, my God, I love it. You know, let's do it. She goes, but first... I need to get buy-in from the PTA and the parents mm -hmm. and the teachers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she said, we did a survey to find out how parents are feeling about ethnic education. I think that's what they're calling it. One of the questions was, do you feel confident talking to your students about racism? Most of them said no. Do you feel comfortable talking to a student who tells you, somebody just said a racial slur in the classroom. Do you feel comfortable and equipped to answer that question? Mm -hmm. Most of them said no. Mm -hmm. And then they asked, do you feel ethnic studies are important in school? Most of them said no. You wonder if they really understood. Right. Like, right? reread right. that question one more time. Because wow. if you're wondering why you're not comfortable talking about it yeah. and not prepared or equipped to speak mm -hmm. to a student who encounters this, but then you don't think it's important to even bring into the school. That's the reason why. Parents, I think, sometimes think school is school and home is home. And there isn't crossover. And there's so much opportunity for crossover and should be. So the videos, how many videos? Are you still producing the videos? Are there a set number that folks can access on your website? Tell me about those. The um, Heroes of Color videos, there are four right now. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one's on the Harlem Hellfighters. The second one is on a man named Gaspar Yanga, who was mm -hmm. enslaved in Mexico from West Africa. And he started this rebellion, brought in some indigenous people from the land, and he was able to escape Spanish rule and actually started his own little town where they prospered for over 30 years. To this day in Veracruz, Mexico, there is a town mm -hmm. called Yanga. It's funny because my wife didn't even know this man existed. This is in Mexico, and a lot of Mexican people are not aware of it because of the same reason. They don't mm -hmm. tend to include Afro-Latinos in Hispanic culture as well. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's really sad. It's really sad. Same yeah. thing in the Dominican Republic. You know, mm -hmm. we have this class system based on the complexion of your skin. And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, my God, are we, are we really still doing this? And then so the third video was on a social worker 
from mm. <laughs> New York. Uh, mm. Her name was Dr. Antonia Pantoja. Mm. And she came from Puerto Rico and she started a nonprofit which was designed to help Spanish speaking students who couldn't speak English. Mm-hmm. They basically took the Board of Education to court, sued them, and won. Mm-hmm. And because of that, forced the school to teach, you know, uh, ESL. Basically, that's mm-hmm. how ESL started in New York. Wow. That's um, great. So that was yeah. huge. And then the fourth one was on Dr. Ronald McNear, who was the astronaut, one of the mm-hmm. seven astronauts that died in the space shuttle challenge explosion. Right now, I'm working on four new episodes. And that is being made possible by a competition that I won in 2019 by a organization, a nonprofit called Black Public Media. It's kind of like a shark tank for Mm -hmm. filmmakers. And you have to get up on stage and pitch your product and ask for the money and, you know, hope that you wow the audience. I wanted to make sure that I put the audience on my side, like quickly. Mm -hmm. So anytime you're pitching... You know, there are a couple of things that you always want to keep in mind. Number one is we are emotional people. We make decisions based on emotion. Absolutely. So yeah. if I can get the audience emotional, it doesn't have to be mm-hmm. sad. It could be happy mm-hmm. quickly, then I'm in good shape. So yes. the guy that came up before me, he had this, oh my goodness, the most emotional piece in the world. He had half the audience crying. The judges were crying. I was like, there's no way in the world I'm going to top this because you got the judges crying, they're on your side. Mm -hmm. So I get up and I open with a joke. And I open with the first thing out of my mouth is a joke and half the room roared with laughter. I mean, it wasn't that funny, Mm -hmm. but I think the timing was perfect. They needed it. They needed it. It was the opposite of the tears they needed. Exactly. Right? Different kind of release. Good for you for Mm -hmm. knowing. It was, well, I didn't. I did. I just like, you know what? I have to try something. I did that and they all laughed. And then I made my introduction. They're like, okay, now the judges, who's going to go first? And the first one's like, I loved it. I, I love everything about it. You know, <laughs> when are you going to start working on the series? And the second one's like, hey, my mother uh, was a school teacher in Santa Clarita. Mm. I'd love to share this with her. And then the third one's like, I want my kids to read your book. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> PBS was very impressed with the project. The deal is basically once we have the eight, Mm -hmm. then they want to talk about, you know, putting it on PBS and figuring out a way to monetize it. So the first four that I have are available online. Mm -hmm. The next four that I do will not be available online because I need to keep that level of exclusivity for PBS so that, hey, Mm -hmm. you want to see it? Come to PBS, you know, that type of thing. No, I think it's great. And I think they're a perfect medium to to host it. I mean, they're just great. You know, my kids grew up on, you know, Arthur and there's always a lesson in there somewhere. And and this is where kids, you know, identify with these characters. And when they can start seeing heroes who look like them, what a gift for that child. Because a typical white kid sees them sort of all around themselves and make assumptions about it. They don't have to try so hard to look for it. And I also honestly hope for the white kids, I think what's, you know, what I think with my own kids, or I hope I was able to do, is that you want to expose kids who are in the majority Um, things that are outside of that. So their viewpoint isn't so narrow. And I think being a religious minority, I was forced to do that anyway. And so I had that sensitivity, but not everybody does. And I think it would bring us much closer to larger community if we did that. You mentioned something that made me think. You said, um, you know, it's important for us to, you know, as, as we speak to the majority you know, mm-hmm. make sure that they're understanding other perspectives. And I think for myself, I have to ask, you know, white people as well. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this thing. Like, I want to hear mm-hmm. what you're thinking. There's a woman that I've always admired, Jane Elliott. And mm-hmm. she actually would be will be one of the speakers at my art con- conference that I'm doing at the end of the month. 
Jane Elliott is the diversity educator known for her blue-eyed, brown-eyed exercise, which she first conducted with her third grade class in 1968. I actually used that same exercise with sixth, seventh, and eighth graders in the early 1980s when I was student teaching. The exercise was the first of its kind to provide a kinesthetic or hands-on experience regarding discrimination and really teaching how discrimination feels. Jane Elliott will also be featured as a panelist at David's upcoming conference, Art and Activism Con. Today, I spoke with her. We did a, just kind of a walkthrough in the virtual world. Mm -hmm. And it was supposed to be a five minute thing just to show her how it works. And we ended up staying on for about an hour, you wow. know, and she's just sharing all these incredible stories and it's so amazing to hear for so many years, she was dedicated to that work of mm -hmm. ensuring that the schools are not brainwashing kids, you know? Mm -hmm. And I mean, she lived in a completely different era. All of the things she's lived through, I read about, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. she lived through it. So yeah. it's important to understand different people's perspectives. And mm -hmm. I often wonder how can you know, a, a specific group of people see things so totally different. By bringing this into the schools or into PBS or at such an early age, hopefully it's creating that um, atmosphere of recognition that I, in my white skin, am not the only, right? And that's such an important thing that I, this hero that I'm seeing who may have lived, you know, 50 years or however many years ago did this thing and overcame this issue and look what they had to struggle through just having heroes who do remarkable things who don't look like me is very powerful because I can find heroes who look like me so I love that you've got congratulations by the way on that um, winning that award I think it's fantastic I love that you're doing this series I can't wait till it's on PBS or I'll purchase or whatever the deal is because I have seen some of your videos online and I adore them that's how a piece of how we got connected I love your book Little Heroes of Color because it starts at a much you know if a littler kid can see themselves it's such a gift and then I know that you um, really, and you started to do it a little bit on the podcast around uh, instruction on how to present. So I think you are a mentor and a model and are in the world of creating these artpreneurs. And so how do you build your own? How do you do a pitch? How do you think about these things? The presentation piece really came again out of frustration because when I graduated college, I didn't know how to get a client and handle a client and even price my work. Like I knew nothing about that. I only, mm -hmm. I was only taught how to work for somebody else. I was never taught how to work for myself. So mm -hmm. when I left Disney, I was forced to learn how to work for myself and I was really bad at it. You know, it was so bad that I, that I ended up needing to get a full-time job four months after because it just wasn't working mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and while I was at that job I was just the worst employee you could think of that was me I was I was disgruntled I was un I just I hated going to that job because you wanted to be doing I, your own thing I wanted to be doing my other you know my other yeah. stuff and yeah. again you know I've really been blessed Laura with with amazing people in my life because I was at this company I was at State Farm and at State Farm, if you get written up three times, you're fired. I was in one month and I had already been written up twice. Mm -hmm. So the third write up was a month after, um, I believe it was like dress down Friday and I may have had the wrong sneakers on or something. I don't remember what it was. It was wow. something about my sneakers. Another supervisor who I've never spoken to in my life walks by, his name is Gary Zakarian. And he mm -hmm. says, David, can I talk to you for a minute? I'm like, I already got three write-ups. He's like, no, 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 this is some completely different. So he brings me into his office mm -hmm. and he starts by saying, um, I've been at State Farm for like 20 years. He's like, I love this job because I am so good at it. I love helping people out in their time of greatest need and I'm able to do it beautifully. I belong in this company because that's my passion. He's mm -hmm. like, I don't know anything about you other than you love to draw. Mm -hmm. You love to create. 
Mm -hmm. And that is your passion. He says, you don't belong in this company. Mm -hmm. He's like, what are you doing here? I'm like, well, you know, I need a job. He's like, don't waste your time in a place that is not going to nurture your talents. He's like, you belong out there creating and telling stories and doing things that are going to fill your heart, not your bank account. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, man, who mm -hmm. is this guy? You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's the second time that's happened. Yes. To you, right? Yes. The that, first was the portfolio. The first was at the amazing. Oh, yeah. Right. Harlem wow. YMCA. So anytime mm -hmm. I deviated off the path, mm -hmm. they, God would bring somebody in my life to say, wait, you, you need mm -hmm. to go back this way. So mm -hmm. Gary got me sitting at my desk thinking and I said, like, you know what? He's he's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go back out there. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to start looking for work in my industry. I kid you not, like two weeks later, I ended up getting a job as a character designer on an animated show. And Perfect. I sent Gary a thank you card because oh. I had appreciated so much, you know, mm -hmm. just his words, you know, that mm -hmm. somebody who doesn't even engage with you mm -hmm. would have enough wisdom to spot that not only do you not belong here, but I want to help place you where you do belong. Last month, I attended a, uh, or facilitated this um, workshop with the LAUSD. It was for junior high school students. Mm -hmm. And they had, you know, a bunch of speakers come in and they were going to do it in Zoom. But I pitched, hey, let's do it in the virtual world. Mm -hmm. I can create a world. I can create buildings. You can walk around and engage with people. And if your characters get close together, your cameras pop up so we can talk in real time. Cool. And I sold them on the idea and they paid $10,000 to get this thing done. The mm -hmm. day of the event, literally five minutes into it, we have all kinds of technical issues. Oh, no. And oh. The, here comes another teaching moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One of the speakers was Erica Huggins, who was one of the founding members of the Black Panther Party. I mean, everybody's time is valuable, but we were so lucky to have her because she was so, like, well sought out for speaking. Yeah, yeah. of course. And of everybody, she was sitting there, you can see her on the camera, just calmly, very patiently, just waiting. Just waiting, mm. not in a hurry, not in a rush, not worried. I'm sweating, dropping bullets all over my face. And mm -hmm. so I finally figured it out, and I was able to breathe again. And then Erica starts talking and she says, did you notice how different the, the atmosphere felt once David was experiencing these technical difficulties? Did you feel it? She's like, everybody was just on edge and, and mm -hmm. flustered and just ready to attack. And eventually he figured it out. Mm -hmm. She's like, if there's one thing that I learned when I was arrested was that discomfort teaches. Wow. Anytime you're in a very uncomfortable situation, you're in the process of learning something. I didn't answer your original question about the art and the speaking. I went off, but that all came about because I wanted to learn how to manage my business. And yeah. once I started to get a better understanding of it, I wanted to help other art students figure that out. So I started yeah. offering these workshops at community colleges and the, the workshop series was called The Business of Freelancing. It was um, a series of about four different workshops. And I taught it at uh, CalArts, the mm -hmm. School of Visual Arts in New York, um, Canyon, Con so many different like community mm -hmm. colleges mm -hmm. and universities. Um, mm -hmm. And it just blossomed into other things, you know, where in, um, I believe it was 2018, I decided to start a program called Junior entrepreneurs I and the, the focus of that was to teach kids mm -hmm. how to take their work their you know paintings or whatever put it on different canvases like a hat a skateboard a canvas shoes and then turn around and sell it and mm -hmm. learn how to start a business so it's basically taking the old school lemonade stand I and actually it. applying your your love for drawing mm -hmm. and making money off of it and then at mm -hmm. the very last class it was actually an art show. So every student had their own table and mm -hmm. they got to sell their work. So we invited the community to come. The local newspaper mm -hmm. came. They wrote up a story. Mm -hmm. You know, now you got to keep in mind, these kids are selling stuff for like five and ten dollars. And perfect. they were selling 
over two, three hundred dollars worth of stuff. You're teaching them the fundamentals of not only using their creative talent, but applying it in a in in some ways in a commercial way, right? But in a positive way to say, how can you get the biggest bang out of your buck for doing this? So can you apply it on here? Can you put on shoes? Can you put on whatever it is? And I think those are incredibly valuable lessons, not to mention putting a table out and being proud of your work, whether someone buys it or not, because that's a valuable lesson too. So tell me about this conference that you're doing and tell me about this sort of virtual environment that you've created that will allow people to attend it and, and actually, it sounds like, kind of connect, not on a Zoom platform, but on an interactive platform, if I understand that correctly. I learned of this, this um, program called Topia, T-O-P-I-A dot mm-hmm. I-O. They bring you onto a welcome screen and it looks like a video game. And so you have a little character that you can control with your mouse or the arrow mm-hmm. keys. And there were three little bodies, you know, up on the top. So I walked towards them. Mm-hmm. And as I got close to them, I started hearing their audio come on, like little by little. I started to hear it get louder and louder. Mm-hmm. And then as I got close to them, their cameras came on. And so we all saw each other. And I'm like... And so it became an intimate subject yeah. with that the group of people. Exactly. Cool. So I'm like, can you guys hear me? They're like, hey, welcome. How are you? I'm like, oh, this is crazy. So, you know, this was supposed to be just like a quick little introduction. We ended up speaking for like three hours, complete wow. strangers. And I started learning from them. It turns out three of them were developers of this program. Mm-hmm. And so they're like, you can take this and you can totally redesign it. We're just giving you a blank, black and white template. But if you're a designer, you can go in. After I left State Farm... I started working at a video game company for a little while, long enough Mm -hmm. to learn background design and isometric Mm -hmm. design. So it came back to architecture again. Mm -hmm. And and I was like, this is great. I'm going to play around with this. So I played around with it. I built this world. And then I got this school in Los Angeles called the Merman School. They wanted to hire me to do a workshop, the Little Heroes of Color workshop. So I did that for them. And this was in January. So then in February, they say hey, we want to do a Black History Month um, workshop. Do you have anything like that? I said, I do, but I have an even better pitch. Why don't we do a Black History Month in this Black History world? Mm -hmm. They're like, Mm -hmm. what? This sounds crazy. So I built it. I was scared because I'm like, I don't even know if this thing is going to work. But part of being a great salesman is just completely believing in your product. Even Mm -hmm. if you're not sure how you're going to do it, but mm-hmm. you let the other person know that, oh, I got this. Don't worry about it. I had a lot of sleepless nights, Sandra will tell you. Um, and I figured it out. So the day of the event, you got all these kids running around, clicking on stuff, learning about different inventors and scientists. And, you know, the teachers were like, holy smokes, what's happening right now? Mm-hmm. You know, our kids have never been disengaged. And I was like, OK, I think I'm onto something with this with this mm-hmm. world. I figured out if I can create a world that celebrates a specific theme, celebrating artists who do work very similar to me, where they're Mm -hmm. promoting culture, where they're promoting activism, you know, social justice, and they're using their Mm -hmm. art form as a tool, that's who I want to celebrate. So I started reaching out to different speakers to see if they'd be interested, Um, you know, and I knew I was going to already start spending money. So I was like, I'm probably not going to make a profit, but mm-hmm. that's okay because I'm I'm starting to plant some seeds of something that could potentially be larger. Mm-hmm. And, and it's the first one. Yeah, it's, it's the, the first, first one. one it's, yeah, exactly. Okay. It's the first one for the exhibitors. When you walk up to their little table, you click on their table and a pop-up comes up, which is their shop page. So you can make a sale right in the world. Mm-hmm. And it's fantastic because it gives the artist an opportunity to actually speak to the potential customer. I managed to get a keynote speaker. His name is Dr. Khalil uh, Muhammad, who is the public policy, race, and history teacher at Harvard. Mm -hmm. Now, I met him through the Schomburg Center when I did my first Heroes of Color video. So I reached out to him. I said, I'd love to have you as a speaker. I've seen many of your talks. And there was one specifically that stood out to me where he mentioned, I think it was at Morgan State, he mentioned children are taught to color within the lines. 
Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. And they're told that if you go out of the line, that's wrong. You never mm -hmm. want to go out of the line. And he's like, what we're doing is we're teaching kids. Um, we're preventing them from exploring. Yeah. So sure. many things happen when you do the wrong thing or when you go mm -hmm. the wrong way. Mm -hmm. You may discover something completely new, mm -hmm. you know, or triggered by a bad, a bad experience that mm -hmm. now leads you to create your own thing. So mm -hmm. he went on to explain this. And I was like, oh, my God, it's beautiful for what I want to do in this convention. So I got him and I told him, look, I don't want to offend you, but all I can afford to pay you is 400 bucks, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And he says to me in one sentence, he goes, I've been a fan of yours since 2015. Mm -hmm. This is not about the money. Keep your money. Just tell me when you want me there and I'm there. I was like, yeah. oh man. But that's such, David, that's such a huge endorsement of you, your work. And the other thing is that your ability to be a risk taker in the spaces where you feel like there needs to be a voice. What's the name of the conference? So it's called the Art and Activism Conference. Love it. And it's from May 28th, 29th, so and 30th. Out and we have exhibitors who have mm -hmm. tables. Um, these are artists who have been doing, demonstrating their activism through art, through poetry. Love and, you know, we have some guest speakers who are going to be coming in. Mm -hmm. Jane Elliott is one of them. Karen Parsons, who was the actress from Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Mm -hmm. After her acting career ended, she started doing a series of... Uh, she started a nonprofit, and she started doing a series of children's books highlighting yes. African-American heroes, um, right. which was amazing, you know? And mm -hmm. so I was able to get other speakers to come in who are doing the same type of work. Um, there's another woman, her name is Caridad de la Luz, and she's mm -hmm. a poet. She wrote one on the uh, death of George Floyd, and mm. it was the most powerful thing I think I've ever heard in my life. Mm. So I reached out to her and said, I would, I would love to have you aboard mm -hmm. as a speaker mm -hmm. just to talk about, you know, number one, where do you get the courage I spoke to Jane Elliott today, I mentioned, and I asked her a similar question. Mm -hmm. And I said, I know you had death threats. You know, everybody in her town hated her for what she was doing. And mm -hmm. she said, yeah, there were multiple death threats, mm -hmm. you know. And I was like, what gives you the courage to continue? Great question. And mm -hmm. she said, if you don't have something in your life that's worth fighting for or worth dying for, then you're wasting your time. Again, I'll share with you, I'm terrified. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm scared, but I'm doing it scared, mm -hmm. you know? And as people come on and, and, and support it and say, I love this, and every now and again, I'll get ticket sales, that keeps pushing me in the direction, like, keep going, don't stop, mm -hmm. keep going. You know, anytime mm -hmm. I feel down, somebody makes a sale, I'm like, okay, I got to keep moving. I can't, mm -hmm. you know? So I'm excited about it, you know, and more than anything, I think I'm excited about the fact that I'm able to try these new things, even though I'm scared. Mm -hmm. And I, I keep looking to other people to see what obstacles they faced, you know, mm -hmm. and we're able to overcome them. And it, to, it doesn't matter what ethnicity they are. Like, I just look at other people's struggles just in general. Mm -hmm. You know, many of us have had some obstacles and are still going through things, but right. we keep pushing through, mm -hmm. you know. And so for me, it's finding what it is that enables you to keep fighting and I use that to keep going. So David, um, as you know, it's toward the end of our podcast, we always ask a round of quick gutsy questions. I'm ready, let's go. What is at the top of your wish list for heroes of color, for sort of the general, I use that as a large term because you're doing so many things. However, the answer can't be money or resources. This work has never been about the money. Um, mm -hmm. this work has always been about the exposure and mm -hmm. I love, absolutely love for K through six curriculum to include some sort of a little heroes of color, you know, series or month mm -hmm. or something where they allow students an opportunity to dig into their own culture and give presentations about their culture, help them highlight people of different ethnicities and backgrounds. And mm -hmm. even if they're white students, take the time to learn about other people of color and highlight their, you know, accomplishments. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. you know, bring it out in the forefront. Like, let's be vocal about having these types of conversations and let's mm-hmm. start at a younger age group. So Heroes of Color really is an opportunity to open up discussions where people right. have been either uncomfortable or afraid mm-hmm. to do so. So that is my big, big picture is that it. this is in schools, all states, and eventually, you know, we get to a point where we don't need to say diversity and inclusion anymore. We don't need to have, you know, head of diversity at Disney, head of diversity at somewhere mm-hmm. else. Like, it should be the norm. If you were to think of a song that describes heroes of color, what would it be? <laughs> it's a fun one. Um, I think of Marvin Gaye, um, What's Going On? just because he asks so many questions about what's happening in society and Mm -hmm. how we've just become so complacent with accepting Mm -hmm. the lies that are given to us and the struggles Mm -hmm. that, you know, we're forced to sort of endure. is not so much just the words of the song, but the struggle that he went through to Mm -hmm. even have that song recorded. His record label wanted nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. They told him, look... We're not going to bring any musicians. You do it yourself. We're not paying Mm -hmm. for this because it was so controversial at the time for him to do this type of song. I go to his values. I look at what his values were as an artist. And that Mm -hmm. is why I thought of that song first. It takes a lot of courage to do something like that and potentially ruin your career based on your morals. He's another hero of color. Oh, absolutely. What makes heroes of color gutsy? You're definitely gutsy. What do you think makes Heroes of Color gutsy? I'm able to evoke so many emotions on both sides of the spectrum. I'm able to make people proud and happy. I'm also Mm -hmm. able to make people angry and hateful. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing that some people would rather avoid talking about the work that I'm doing to prevent them from feeling uncomfortable about a bias or an insecurity that they may have. Mm -hmm. Share a really super quick story with you. When I was at a PTA meeting with my kids in my kids' school, they mentioned they were gonna stop using Scholastic because they wanted to try a different vendor. And this was before Little Heroes came out. I said, listen, at least wait one year before you switch vendors. They're like, why? It's like, well, because I'm publishing a book with Scholastic and it's coming out next year. So everybody was like, oh, that's great. That's fantastic. I got all this love. They're like, what's the name of the book? I said, it's called Little Heroes of Color. And it's celebrating um, people who have accomplished amazing things. People of color from different ethnic groups. Complete silence. You could hear a pin drop. And the following words were, on to the new business. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Couldn't even take it in. They couldn't Couldn't take it. So things Mm -hmm. like that. I feel is what makes this gutsy work because you either love it or you hate it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why that is, but that's where we are. You're moving forward and hopefully people will get on the train because the train is moving. Jump on board or uh, step aside. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Or step aside. I like that too. So what is something that outsiders or maybe even a few insiders don't know about heroes of color? Insiders may not realize that with all of the heroes that I pick, Mm. I try to connect or at least have some sort of pick a common ground with them. Like there's something that they did Mm -hmm. that I can relate to because it's easier for me to tell their story if I can relate Mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. Um, But I understand that that's not the best way to tell stories because we're not going to relate to everybody, but we can Mm -hmm. still learn from situations but even if you talk to me about the Holocaust and I, I can't say that I can understand what that must have felt like, but I understand what it feels like to be scared. I understand yeah. what it feels like to take a risk. Um, mm-hmm. There's different levels of that. But mm-hmm. just to know that this is a crossroads in my life. I need to either make this choice, do this thing and mm-hmm. this might happen or stay here and I know exactly what's going to happen. So yeah. I'm going to take that risk. If I can't relate to their story directly, I want to make sure that I am inspired by their story. And that helps me pick a hero. Oftentimes I try to do the same thing. 
uh, when I introduce my podcast to my guest, because I don't know your organization, but I really try to get to a place that it's relatable because I think what you're doing is should be relatable for all of us. If you could get one celebrity or influencer to endorse or talk about your organization, who would it be? Do you know Henry Louis Gates? Oh, sure. Of course. So he saw my work, Mm -hmm. um, the the Harlem Hellfighters, on Twitter, and he retweeted it and mentioned it twice. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was pretty awesome. Um, that is awesome. Because he is a historian. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I can't think of any celebrities. I mean, he, I guess, could be considered well, he, a celebrity. I think he'd be considered one, yeah. But yeah. I'd love to, to be able to, like, actually have a sit down with him mm-hmm. and have him talk, like, interview about Heroes of Color, the impact that I hope it makes, and mm-hmm. introduce it to his audience because he does stuff for PBS, um, mm-hmm. so PBS, right That's back at right. the PBS family, I feel like that would be the ultimate endorsement for me because it's in the realm of history mm-hmm. and it's targeting my group. So mm-hmm. Henry Louis Gates Jr. Yeah, I love it. And we'll tweet, you know, we'll, when this podcast comes out, we'll tweet him and we'll see what happens <laughs> as you build further build your relationship with PBS. I'm hoping that will happen. What a great, great thing. What is the best way for folks to reach you? And how can people sign up for this conference? So is it in the same place or a different place? Heroesofcolor.com, H-E-R-O-E-S, of color.com. The minute you log in, there's going to be a big old banner saying the mm-hmm. Art and Activism Conference. Click on it and you'll either come in as an attendee or an exhibitor if you want to exhibit your work. Mm-hmm. And you can contact me there. Uh, there's a contact me button. I'm mostly on LinkedIn and Instagram. My LinkedIn is, I think it's just David Heredia, H-E-R-E-D-I-A. And on Instagram, it's underscore heroes of color. I can't tell you how enjoyable this conversation was and how much I, I learned and what I took in from you today. Thank you for being part of Small and Gutsy. Thank you so much. It was an honor for me and, and I was excited about this and really, really looking forward to it. And I just thank you for taking time from your schedule um, and Pavel as well to, to host me. So thank you so much. Our blog of these small and gutsy nonprofits and social impact organizations can be found in the organizational story section of the Intrinsic Group website so that we can continue to link clients, volunteers, future employees, and donors to the small but mighty network. Of course, we can't take responsibility outside of our own vetting of the organizations we interview, so before you sign on to support or work for them, we encourage you to do your own due diligence and research them as well. We just want you to learn about the small and gutsy nonprofit and social impact organizational sector so they can spread their story and their very impactful work. I want to thank my partners in this endeavor, the Intrinsic Group, a management consulting firm specializing in guiding organizations to leverage talent, optimize processes and to ensure the organization's narrative is aligned with their culture. The volunteers, my co-producer, sound engineer and composer, the amazing Pavel Franson, my exceptionally talented graphic designer, Nate Addy, my social work intern extraordinaire, Stephanie Tran. Please check out their bios on the Intrinsic website and all the folks, friends and family who have guided and inspired me. And thank you for listening. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends. Give us some stars and write a review on wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you're interested in sponsoring Small and Gutsy to keep it going, please reach out to me at reachus at theintrinsicgroup.com or buy us a coffee at www.buymeacoffee.com backslash small and gutsy. So as you all know, we've started since our 10th episode to give shout outs to all of you who are giving a shout out to us. So here we go. Ted at the tour podcast said, it's about time we have a podcast like Small and Gutsy. Thanks, Ted. We feel the same way and we want to keep it going. From Small and Gutsy to Big with Impact, I'm Laura Whitcoff and thanks for listening. <laughs>